Video Trade. This is Don Kaufman, August 29th, 2020. Recording the weekend update here on this Saturday morning. The trade driving markets higher. You know, on this weekend's update, rather than state the obvious, look, the markets just continue. Perpetual motion, if you will, to the upside. I'm actually going to break down a little bit of what I would term some trader geek speak on this weekend's update and get into some definitive reasons of not only why the markets continue to drive higher, but the specifics of what is driving the markets higher. I'm even going to look at the most influential players in this marketplace. And I think a lot of this is going to surprise people, but bear with me, okay? It's it's early here on a Saturday morning, and we're going to get into some pretty deep, what I would term, trader, again, geek speak, all right? So that's that had to be one of the bullets over here, trader geek speak, because very few people look at kind of the underpinnings of what is actually driving trade. And a very large part, what you're looking at in your screen right now is the SPX and the expected moves. We're gonna come back to that here in just a moment because it's a critical, okay? Like it's a critical tell in what is forcing these markets to the upside. As I said, almost perpetual motion, if you will, to the upside. Again, this weekend's update, it's all about the trade that is driving this market higher. So let's get to work. As I said, I'm gonna cover a little bit of Trader Geek speak. We'll go through a couple of uh, different aspects and odds and ends that I think are critical to understand if you are kind of what I would term in the trade. And then we'll come back around and actually uh, really get into what is you know forcing markets higher. One of the first things that I wanted to talk about here uh, on this weekend's update, the skew. The skew is extreme. And if you don't know what that means, it's all right. And, and again, skew is kind of like an option, you know, geek terminology. Again, this is all about geek speak, right? And I think the best way actually to delineate skew to you would to be bringing up the spiders, a little easier maybe to see in the spiders. Go to the spiders, go to an option that's maybe 30 days out, right? So you go 30 days out, open up just a ton of strikes, and of course, take to some volume, cruise down to something like implied volatility. When I'm referencing what I'm saying, like skew, all right? The skew has to do with here is a 22.3%, okay? implied volatility. But this implied volatility and here on Thinkorswim, that implied volatility is, if you will, it's like an averaging formula. They take a ton of the calls and a ton of the puts, average them all together, yada, 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 boom, here we are at 22.3%. Uh, but the reason that I'm actually talking about, you know, skew is extreme, okay, the skew being extreme, people just look at the out of the money puts here. I mean, these out of the money puts, these are way out of the money puts 30 days out, okay, that is, uh, Effectively, what, what the market is telling you, the market, you know, normally we look at it as a nice distribution curve. Well, this marketplace right now, and anything that's index or index related, doesn't matter whether it's the spiders or the SPX or the EEM, you know, or even the uh, the financials. If you're if you're in a major sector and a major index and you're index related, you're gonna have skew. And what skew is, instead of being like a perfect, you know, curve over here, like the out of the money calls are trading for $4. The out of the money puts are trading for $4. Well, that crap doesn't work in a skewed marketplace because the out of the money calls, they're not trading for $4. Those little monkeys have been driven down in price, right? They may only be trading for like $2.30. The out of the money puts are completely jacked up, right? They're at like, you know, $5.10. That's what skew does. And the curve isn't so nice. It isn't so lovely. And uh, in very large part, that is what we are seeing right now. And to show you in real context, you know, you know, when you start looking at these out of the money puts, and when I say to put it into context, just take a look at like equidistant, equidistant. So right there, there's a market at 350. It makes it a lot easier, right? I'm actually gonna close up this left side bar. So the market's at 350. So let's go $40 out of the money. In fact, tell you what, we'll even, we'll close that up. We'll even go further out in time, right? Out into the time when there's even going to be an election, which by the way, the skew is jacked, just jacked for the election. So we're actually gonna go 40, $50 out of the money. I tell you what, here we go. We'll just go literally $50 out of the money. Look at the puts. The puts $50 out of the money are trading for what? $4.78. Let's go to the equidistant calls, which would be about the 400 strike calls. There they are, I'm gonna highlight them. All right, 
So the puts are trading for like four or five bucks. The calls, which are equidistant, are trading for 79 cents. Do you understand what I mean by skew? <laughs> I mean, it is, is it abnormal? Well, no, it's natural, but it was, I was saying in my example, like, you know, this isn't a, a warm and fuzzy distribution curve. This is, a, you know, an amalgamation of skew. And by the way, skew is not something that you could just see in an option chain. There's actually a symbol for it, S K S K E W. And the skew is actually running at almost a 146. And you're like, well, first of all, the skew is only calculated. The skew is only calculated uh, literally once a day at the end of the day, which is fine. But if you look back, skew doesn't have like a huge history. We're actually at one of the highest levels of skew really ever recorded. They started recording skew all the way back here in like 2011 was official, you know, time frame of it. But um, yeah, look, the skew is actually completely jacked. And that changes the way you trade. And it should change the way you trade like immediately. And that's why I said on this weekend's update, you know, I know a lot of people are like, let's state the obvious. We should buy gold because the marketplace is going to eventually, no, I can't stand that stuff, okay? None of that crap is going to help you in the here and now. You need to know that the skew is completely jacked. And I'll tell you why you need to know that the skew is so hideous. Because the skew being hideous <clears throat> changes a lot of strategies. For those of you that use like in-out spreads, right? Use an in-out spread. You can't like buy a slightly in the money option because when you're selling the out of the money call, and this is specific for calls, the skew is heavily against you. But I'll tell you what is viable right now more than anything. Okay. Let's just open up a few more strikes in here. Back spreads. When the skew is this heavy, okay, you can actually sell like an at the money call or near at the money call and buy multiple out of the money calls because the skew is actually favorable for you. So you always want to have the wind at your back when it comes to skew. And again, I told you this is going to be trader geek speak, right? And the index puts, and for those of you who are a little newer, and this is like one of the first times you've ever tuned into Theo Trade, and this guy's going off about skew in the first five minutes of a weekend update. This is where you need to get to, okay? To not only succeed, you know, trading options, but you just have to have some knowledge because the skew is actually telling you literally what you can do and what you can't do as a trader. And that's why skew is of critical importance. All right, let's continue. Bonds, all right, let's actually move over to the bonds. The bond market, <clears throat> and I think that this is also, you know, one of those things that's critical. In fact, you know what, I thought that was kind of cool. We had it up on a uh, on a 10 year. The move that you just saw uh, in the last like two to three weeks, this, this is starting to show up, okay? When I say it's starting to show up, we have a, uh, I would say kind of a critical juncture forming inside of the bond market. The bond market, you know, the Fed is doing nothing but interest rates are gonna be low forever. They're gonna be low forever, except the bond market disagrees. There's dissent, okay? Right here, that is the uh, kind of the here and now. This is, uh, again, this is a nine month daily, but the, uh, the last three weeks in the bonds, the bonds have been getting crushed. Now they haven't made, and this is why I say this, we're at like kind of this, this critical juncture. The bonds haven't, broken, okay, lower, but they're right on the edge of that. Now there was a bond roll, they look like they drop a little bit more, but you want a number in here? If the bonds actually break like through the 170, okay, 170 handle, now, they're more than a hop, skip, and a jump. That's a five point move in bonds for them to break down. But if the bonds break down below 170, okay, you, you can almost expect that the Fed is gonna come back out and surprise, they're going to, uh, to talk the bond market off the edge. The reason being the interest rates, okay? The TNX, the interest rates associated with this, um, they're exploding at this point. And I just, I can't stress this enough. Like bonds drop, driving rates higher. I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory, but the interest rates you're looking at right here, this is the TNX. The TNX is the 10-year. The 10-year in just the last few weeks, I mean, it was sitting at, I know this is you know 5.2, but the way this works is it's 0.5%. So the 10-year interest rate sitting at 0.5%, it just shot in a time where you know oh, and interest rates are never going up again, and most people don't realize it's at you know point let's call it 7.3. That doesn't seem like that's huge. It's just huge. It's a really big move, and this could start to get out of control, and it could pop to the upside, and all of a sudden you have a one percent, one percent interest rate. You have to think about that in context. You too can tie up your money for the next ten years at one percent. Well, right now you can only get 0.7 percent, but the thing is, okay, with this, it's an influential trade. 
It's a really influential trade because what it's doing is interest rates are exploding. The financials loved it this week. In fact, when I looked at the auto expected moves in the financials, the financials okay, exploded outside of their expected. And we'll talk about expected move here in just a moment. What else actually exploded outside? Well, the NASDAQ, everybody's like, oh, the NASDAQ, man. The Na oh, look, the NASDAQ didn't. Okay, I mean, the NASDAQ, yeah, it closed higher here, but it was not as explosive as the financials over there. Then we actually cruise over to the SPX, and this is this is where stuff is going to start to get a little, little crazy. So as I said, on this weekend's update, I wanted to kind of geek out a little bit and really talk. I mean, that's the title here is the trade that's actually driving markets higher. So now, now we're going to do a little bit more of an explanation, if you will, of these expected moves. Okay, expected move. All right, is denoted by three lines on your screen. What the expected move is really derived from, and again, those of you that are experienced, sit tight here for two seconds. What the expected move is derived from, okay, has everything to do with the options marketplace. So these expected moves are projected, okay, to the next Friday. When I say the next Friday, I am going to draw the expected moves and I hand draw every one of these lines on the screen. I'm gonna hand draw the expected moves for the coming week. What is the expected move gonna be? What is the expected move? Well, we go out to next Friday, right? We go out to next Friday and we take a look at, okay, the expiration, which is, again, the Friday expiration, always the PM settlement. And we look over here to the far right-hand side of the screen and it says $62.17 based on a 16% implied volatility. So $62 is the expected move. But we only look at this expected move on a Friday afternoon after the market closes for the following Friday. So here we are, okay, today, and it's, you know, August 29th and we're already looking at the SEP4. And why are we looking at the SEP4? Because that's next Friday. Why do we always look at Friday? And by the way, it's static. Once I actually place the expected move onto the chart, that's it. It's $62. The reason that we're so adamant that this is the expected move that you want to follow, it has to do, okay, with market makers or we're also sometimes termed dealers rolling inventory forward. I want to show you the volume and open interest, okay? This is just a weekly you know, you're like, it's a weekly, man. Who cares? Who cares? It's just, just a, ah, it's just a weekly. Listen, okay. The weeklies right now are driving trade in a huge way. You start taking a look at some of the volume in here. Oh, I'm still scrolling, people. There are tens of thousands of contracts, and those tens of thousands of contracts, okay, are continually rolled forward a week in and week out. By the way, you can compare, you know, like the Wednesday contracts. The Wednesday contracts actually see a little bit of volume. You can even take a look at the Monday contracts. The Monday contracts, ah, eh, they're not trading nearly as much, okay? But there are literally, there's some decent volume in here. There's uh, there's literally, all right, tens of thousands of contracts that are constantly rolled forward into the next Friday, making Friday by far and away the most important. Now, the expected move itself, and here's the point that I wanna make with the expected move of why it's so critical, why it's gonna drive trade, okay? That expected move of the, the $62, right? That's not just a fictitious number. What it basically is and what it's based off this volatility. The $62 kind of averages all the option prices in this entire chain. So if dealers are buying and selling, market makers are buying and selling any of these options, if proprietary traders are buying and selling any of these options, okay, they're doing that predicated basically on a $62 average. So that $62 becomes effectively the expected move. What market makers do throughout the course of the week. And I'll just give you an idea of how this is done because I, I don't want to get into you know exact context of it, but here's how it works. Okay, big trading firm goes out and they sell. They sell the at the money, let's say straddle, right? They just sell an at the money straddle and they may do it a few thousand times. You know, in here, like, all right, you know, the volume's only 300 here, 300 here. Most of the firms actually use strangles, but let's just say they sell the at the money straddle and they sell it for right around 60 bucks, okay? So they sell it and they sell it for 60 bucks. What it basically does, if they sell that thing for $60, okay, this is where they sold it, okay? Their break even point is up here and down here, which is what? They have plus $60 or minus $60, okay, of kind of room. 
So as long as we stay inside the lines, okay, because again, this trading firm sold, you know, thousands and thousands of, of this trade. As long as we stay inside the lines, they're going to be okay. Now think about that for a second. So we'll make this the $60 move right here. So we can move $60 higher or $60 lower. And they just sit there throughout the course of the week and they go, as long as we stay inside the lines, we're going to be fine. Yeah, well, what happens though is literally, okay, you know, dozens and dozens of trading firms, they all do the exact same trade, but there has to be somebody on the other side of it. So for every seller, there's a buyer. And what you basically get, okay, in this $60 kind of room in here is you get these inflection points higher or lower because there's always a buyer and there's always a seller. And if you actually crest through, okay, the $60 move, remember the initial trading firm that sold, okay, they sold that thing. They have $60 of room to the upside, $60 of room to the downside. And they sit there all week and they go, we're not going to do anything. But if they start crossing through these thresholds, which is the line on the screen, Okay, then they have to what they call dynamically hedge. What's dynamically hedge? They have a server that actually kicks on and they're going to have to hedge off what they term their gamma risk. It's hedging off really their delta risk. Okay. As we go up, this firm would be negative delta. What do you, how what's negative delta mean? Okay. They sold calls. As the calls actually go deep in the money, it produces negative delta. How do, how do you offset negative delta? By adding positive delta. You must balance the equation. As you balance the equation, guess what? How do you get positive delta? You buy, what do you buy? You buy S&P futures. By buying S&P futures, it just drives the market higher. So the second we actually hit this inflection point, we pop to the upside. These edges of the expected move have become critical. They become, you know, literally battlegrounds inside of the marketplace. You go, well, why the SPX? Why should we give a crap about the SPX? I don't even trade SPX. I'm a Tesla guy. Yeah, well, the SPX trades 1.2 million contracts at a $3,500 product. I think that's fairly influential. There's a contract called the Spiders. Familiar with the Spiders? Well, the Spiders did over 4 million. So if you add the SPX, which is 1.2 million, to the Spiders, which is about 1.3 million, okay? Sorry, four, yep. Yeah, so we have 1.2 million, 4.3 million. Then, wait, wait, should we just keep adding this stuff up? I just want to show you how many products. So we had, you know, the 4.3, you had 1.2 million contracts. Then turn around, throw a little like, uh, here, you know what? We could throw some VIX in there. Oh, VIX, VIX is a real party, okay? Well, why not throw some VIX in there because that's good for another 600,000. How many other products, okay? You know, people talk about stuff like VXX. What is VXX? Uh, it's a derivative of the VIX. So that's good for another 400,000. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going and going. You realize that the entire marketplace, okay? Only trades, let's say that yesterday the marketplace did 27 million option contracts, okay? 1.2 of them, and you go 1.2 alone is SPX. You go, why is that so influential? Because it's the $3,500 product. That's the most influential because net net, okay, the SPX is actually 10 times the size of these 4.3 million that traded in the spider. What people don't get, okay, is over like half the marketplace just trades SPX, that's it. They trade SPX, they trade spiders, they trade VIX, they trade VXX. The entire marketplace, okay, it's, it's the cornerstone of the marketplace, it's gonna move everything. And then S&P futures, okay, you know these S&P futures over here? Guess what, S&P futures also have options on futures. So if there's options on futures, that too is the exact same thing as the SPX. The entire trading world revolves around the SPX. And that's what, again, the people just don't get it. And then there's a couple other influential, you know, products over here, but this is what we're talking about with what is dealer gamma risk, right? As soon as we crack outside the expected moves, it's a free for all out here. It's a free for all because everybody's kind of hedging. So it is the gamma risk, okay, that's driving the spoos into the perpetual trade. The way it basically works is lots of dealer gamma risk is having negative gamma. They don't, and, and negative, well, I should say negative, negative gamma and negative delta. But these firms don't set out to be negative delta. And I just can't stress that enough. When I say they don't set out to be, you know, uh, negative, negative delta, okay? Negative delta is because they're taking the other side of your positions, okay? You're a trader and you go out there and buy calls. You know what calls are? Calls are positive delta, which forces the market maker, there's the market maker, to be negative delta. How does the market maker hedge? By adding positive delta, okay? So eventually the market makers are just trying to balance their equation, which is delta, but um, they just continue to buy and just spritz markets higher. 
And that's that's it in a nutshell. I mean, that's what's driving markets. That's, and you also need to know what the influential products are. Obviously, we talked about the SPX, the Spider, the VIX. You want to see another one that's completely crazy? I'm going to show you something that is that is nuts because it owns right now the NASDAQ and people don't realize. Tesla owns that NASDAQ. And you're like, oh, whatever, man. So Tesla's like rallying. It's not that. Tesla is a $2,200 stock. It did a million contracts. That, that's serious, okay? That is carrying notional value that is moving the entire marketplace. And again, Tesla might be included inside of the NASDAQ and, you know, inclusion to the S&P is, is only a hop, skip and a jump away, but it's becoming an influential, it is an influential product. You compare that to something like, well, what's Goldman Sachs doing? Goldman Sachs is a $200 stock with 55,000 contracts. Nobody gives a crap about it. I mean, to give you how influential, how influential is Tesla? This is the financial sector. This is the XLF. This is a $25 product that couldn't eke out 300,000 contracts. So when you start thinking about in terms of what term notional value, notional value is, okay, you trade this many contracts, you trade this many shares, how much capital are we actually moving in the market? XLF all of a sudden becomes a peanut. It's crazy right now, right? Then you go over and you look at something like Apple. Clearly, Apple is an influential marketplace, right? It's a $500 product, trades $1.2 million. But wait a second, all right? It doesn't matter that Apple did 40, you know, 7 million, you know, shares and, and 1.2, okay? Compare Apple once again over to Tesla, and you're going to see Tesla did what? Well, they did 20 million shares, which is less. But the number of option contracts they traded is scary large. Option contracts are moving the marketplace because if you're buying calls, it produces the market maker to be what? Selling the calls and then the market maker has to turn around and actually buy that stock as their hedge. Those are your influential products. People, this is the trade right now that's moving markets. You're like, how, you know, how, do, we, how do we take advantage of this? You understand everything that you possibly can about these expected moves. You look at what's called like auto expected move. Auto expected move can apply expected moves to any product. And look, we're already projecting forward for next week, which is precisely what we should be doing inside of the spires. Okay. And once you start getting outside these lines, that's when, that's when craziness kind of grips hold. And you really want to know what's driving markets. I'll tell you what's driving markets. I mean, you take a look at something like Tesla. It's completely insane. Really? Really? Because it's so insane that it closed on the edge of the expected move. Tell me that's not an influential uh, area in the marketplace, okay? It literally closed on it. Remember, these lines are drawn, again, for already for the next week. This isn't some like fictitious Fibonacci, you know, I got your 618 right here. Uh, it's not like that, right? Yes, we can crack outside the expected move. When we start cracking outside of it, it becomes Mr. Toad's wild ride. Most of the time, though, the marketplace wants to migrate right to it because that's that's where the risk is. Again, the most important thing to understand in this weekend's update, gamma has gripped hold. Okay, correlations they're nowhere really to be found. Okay, you you know people say, well, when's the market going to start doing this or start doing this? You want things to normalize, you have to see correlation. You have to start seeing 90, 95 stocks trading on one side of the marketplace. Then and only then are we really going to start to move more progressively and get and get some real work done in the marketplace other than just this one-sided, you know, and it is a one-sided marketplace to the upside. But everything I just explained to you, okay, want you to recognize and think about one aspect. Whatever works to the upside with negative gamma risk will absolutely also work to the downside. The only difference is, okay, if retail clients start to panic to the downside, it's gonna kick every server out there and this market maker and what they call dealer gamma, it'll kick them all on and it'll cause wild sell side activity. Markets are absolutely fragile. The liquidity out there is not great. This right now is the trade that is driving markets higher. Thanks everybody for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.